jump right into it and uh, talking about wisdom as we continue on and really uh, we're getting to the, the next part chapter 10 and onwards uh, you know right now we're to the sections where everything's kind of uh, lengthy long you know there's several sections of scriptures that go together but uh, and these next chapters coming up it's going to be bits and parts and broken up a little bit more than it is now in chapter 9 as we think about wisdom this is really coming to a conclusion of the introduction I guess if we would talk about Solomon's uh, Proverbs and uh, we'll see this here as we get down through the final appeal call invitation uh, whatever you want to call it. Let's look at it here. Proverbs chapter 9. It says, Wisdom hath built her house, she hath hewn out her seven pillars, she hath killed her beast, she hath mingled her wine, she hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maiden, she crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of my wine, which I have mingled. Forsake the foolish and live, and go in the way of understanding. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a w wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not, reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet be wiser. And teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me... Thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. And if thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself, and if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. Now here's where uh, you see the, uh, the two ends of it. The first part talks about Lady Wisdom. In the middle is where we are, the decision that's got to be made. Wisdom is calling for us to make a decision. And then we see the other end. You know, so we're stuck in the middle for the decision. But on the other end, we see the, the, the foolish lady. Let's look at it. Verse 13, a foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let them turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in, sweet, er, bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell." And that's uh, where we'll end with the passage of Scripture for tonight. And uh, we'll say a quick prayer and get into the sermon. Heavenly Father, Lord, may you control my tongue, my mind, my thoughts. Help me to be still and help me to communicate your passage of Scripture exactly as you've given it to me. Lord, help me to impart your truths. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we find here in chapter 9, wisdom is calling. She's, she's wanting our attention. She's pleading for us. And sometimes it's, I guess maybe for me, it's hard for me to understand why wisdom, just in all the beauty that is laid out here, how come more people were not choosing her? But wisdom is calling. We try to hide our lack of wisdom many times. And it's like a man who goes out. And I know Mr. Adams here recently, he's, he's told me in the time past that he thought about getting a pontoon boat. But I won't use that as an example. I'll, I'll use a different example, okay? There's this man, he's trying to convince his wife that he wants a yacht, a nice yacht. So he goes out and he says, honey, it's going to be okay. She's nervous. She said, you've never sailed before. You've never been out on the ocean, never been out on the lake, never been out on anything. And what makes you think that you can handle something like that? He says, well, honey, I got this. And so he goes out and he, got, he buys this nice yacht and he goes and he, he talks to his friends. You know how that goes. He gets on YouTube and he starts looking up all the videos. He says, you know, I'll try it out on a nice little small area before I get out on the sea. And uh, so he tries to convince his wife as he spends this month trying to get his bearings about him for the sailing that he might have smooth course. And uh, he thinks he has it all under control. So finally one day he gets his wife. Honey, why don't you go out on a ride with me tonight? Why don't uh, you go out on the water and we're going to have a good time. You can trust me, you know. I know you had your doubts initially. But you understand, I've been watching my YouTube videos. I've talked to my friends. And, and uh, you know, I know where all the sandbars are. I know where all the reef barriers are. I know where all the rocks are. And as he 
lifts his wife out onto the boat, and he starts to go out a little ways. They hear this clunk from the stern all the way to the stem, you know, and it's just, he's got this little bit of grin about him because he knows exactly just what happened. That rocked. He, he says, see, honey, <laughs> I told you, you know, it wasn't very far off. We found it. And, uh, you know, he's, he said, we almost missed it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and she wasn't too impressed. But anyway, it shows his lack of knowledge where he thought that he knew everything. But he, he didn't, did he? And that's the way it is many times. We got this under control. I can handle this. I, I, I know what I'm doing. And about the time we say that, we make a fool out of ourselves. And this is really what the, the message really is imparting to us uh, tonight. As I preached to you this past week about wisdom, this particular wisdom that Solomon is referring to is not just going out and uh, studying for a course and passing a test and, you know, they're, they're studying for all the book knowledge and doing, filling in all the answers. That not, it's not the kind of wisdom that he's talking about. This is the test for life. It's for life. Because here he... Many times where he tells us, he says, choose wisdom. This wisdom is going to be life unto you. And if you don't have this wisdom, then it's certainly going to be death. And that's what we see at the end of chapter 9, uh, where the end is hell. But uh, we can say that this is the fundamental of life, this wisdom that we have here. And it's the kind of wisdom that guides the soul according to the wisdom of God in this world, which is very different than the wisdom of this world and now we find wisdom crying out to the passers-by. When I was a kid, you know, I kind of get this picture in my mind. Uh, we had a store down by where the farm is there in Virginia. And uh, it was Larkin's Grocery Store. It's where all the farmers would go and hang out. We had a Diamond L, the tack and uh, shop there where, you know, if you wanted all your Western gear, they would go down there. But uh, most of the people hung out at Larkin's Grocery. And so many times we'd come in and I'd be just a young little lad running around and uh, see these old men. And they're sitting out on the front of the bench. And uh, they have on their little straw hats and their, their thermal uh, underwear on and their overalls on. And they're sitting out front. And I mean, they're just shooting a breeze, you know. And sometimes, every once in a while, they'll talk to you. And uh, you, I find that very interesting because they, they sometimes in that short period of time, you're like, man, I get to learn something. I get to hear a, a story of all this wisdom they've learned because these guys are 70, 80, 90 years old. What can I learn from them? A lot if I had enough time to sit there. And of course, you know, being young, your parents don't let you have all the time in the world to spend with them. They're like, come on, so we got to go. But that, to me, that's what I'm kind of picturing here with wisdom. She has um, built her house. She's hewn out her seven pillars. And, and now she's sitting there inviting men to come in and to sit and to hear and to impart her wisdom to you and I tonight. And that's the image that I have here. She's slain her sacrifices. She's mingled her wine. She's done this. She's done that. All made ready for you and I to come and partake of this wisdom that she has. She's inviting us to share in her company as she imparts this wisdom of God to you. And I want you to understand something tonight, a very valuable lesson, that your attitude toward wisdom is a serious matter. And we look here in the very middle of the, the, the Scriptures here. And we see where it comes down to our choice. We see that there are some who are scorners. And wisdom comes as a rebuke or a reprover. And they don't receive it very well. And many times that's the way it comes to us initially is in reproof, rebuke, an exhortation in order to get our attention. But a wise man will receive it as instruction. It's very important for us to have this wisdom. And uh, we must let wisdom reprove us. And we must let wisdom instruct us to encourage us to direct us. And we must choose wisdom to be wise. And so tonight I broke this down into three parts, if you will, a passionate request from wisdom, a principle revealed, and a personal responsibility. And those are how I broke it down for us tonight. So a passionate request in verses 1 through 6, we look at Lady Wisdom. She leaves you in awe. She's very industrious. She's working very hard. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what kind of imagery that she's trying to give across other than she's very busy. She's very active, working uh, to try to get everything in order, ready in preparation for us to come and to sit at our house as she invites us in. And this is a very luxurious kind of setting for us. 
And so she's busy you know, building her house, hewing out the pillars, setting everything as it is in order for us to come and partake. She sacrifices several beasts of the field, and she has a labor of love is what I see here. She's very influential. She's rich. Most people during this time, when you look at it, even at the days of Jesus, people didn't have pillars in their houses. You know, even today, you know, you don't look over the parsonage and see pillars everywhere, do you? <laughs> uh, same back in this day. You know, they didn't have any pillars anywhere. The only pillars are the ones you put on your bed, right? No, they, they don't have these kind of things. If you were very rich, you might have three pillars. Uh, the people in ancient Egypt, they used to think that heaven was held up by the four pillars of heaven. That all the, the atmosphere, the clouds, the stars, the skies, all of it was held up by the four pillars of heaven. Job talks about, uh, he says, uh, Job 26, 11, The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof, at God's reproof. But it doesn't say how many pillars. In fact, when I look at the pillars of heaven here, that he, she seems to be hewing out. In verse 1 says, Wisdom had built her house, she hewn out her seven pillars. It seems like to be the perfections of God is really what I'm getting out of it. Some people read more into it than what's there. I just say it's the perfections of God. Why? Because in the previous chapter, it said God possessed me from the beginning. He was with God and there was nothing that He made that He didn't use wisdom in order to make it. And so she's there, she's uh, in the heavens. This is God's wisdom that He's trying to impart to us. She's impressive. And the sacrifices, it's not just any old sacrifices, but it's the best that she has. She's impartial in her pleading. She's not picking out certain men and choosing certain ones. She's pleading with everybody. She's intent on getting our attention. And this is the wisdom that we find, again, in chapter 8, possessed by God, trying to show us that we cannot live without God's wisdom. And, of course, we could go over to 1 Corinthians 3 and all that. But no need to for now. But she's full of grace. I say grace because of the sacrifice that she offers that we don't deserve. And full of truth because it comes from God. All of it's freely given. It gives all men liberally and abradeth not. Lady Wisdom is the prevention of disaster and death. And she's able to keep men from falling. And yet, it is her imposter counterpart which men and women pursue. And she makes coming to God easy and appealing. And yet, the hardest part of it all is, is you're contending with the hearts of men. You know, you, you think about children. It's hard to get children to say, you know, one day you're going to understand. It's hard to get young men to say, one day you're going to see the wisdom of what I'm trying to teach you. Right now you're just brushing it off and one day you'll understand. It's hard to get it into the hearts of men because they're not, many times they're like, yeah, 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 right, I've heard all this before. As, as, what I'm trying to say is as appealing and as great and as enamoring and as wonderful and as awe-inspiring, as heavenly and as God-empowering as it is, you're contending with the hearts of men who say, yeah, you know, I've heard all that religious, pious stuff before and you know, this is real life right now. So every time that you see a wreck on the interstate from a drunk driver or somebody who's texting and driving. You see wisdom making her appeal. Hey, pay attention. Don't, don't be like this person. Don't do that. Death faces us all. Uh, every time you see a broken marriage due to adultery or whatever, whether it's uh, mismanagement of finances or uh, just being at odds and not communicating with each other, whatever have you, it says, don't be like that. Don't, don't let your marriage be tore apart because you forsake Wisdom. Every time that we hold a baby in our arms and we go to a funeral and we're faced with that reality of death and that uh, preciousness of life, we, we are confronted with wisdom. Hey, <laughs> there's a lot more to this life than what we give it credit for. And we need God to know how to live. And we need God to know how to die. And so the question is asked, when will men wake up and understand their need for a Savior? And when will they wake up and to the fact that they have been depraved of wisdom, that they don't have it in and of themselves, and don't they know that they need God? How many of you just ask that question all the time? 
Don't, don't people understand that they need God? Don't people understand that they need a Savior? Don't people understand that they are sinners? They can't get to heaven by themselves? Don't people understand what they're missing out on? How can they, how can they face death without God? And you ask these questions all the time, and, and here in this very chapter we find the reasons why. We find the reasons why they reject it. We find the reasons why they are not understanding or why they pass on by. And we see that in the next point, the principle revealed in verses 7 through 11, where man is stuck in this area of what are you going to choose? Are you going to choose Lady Wisdom or are you going to choose the foolish Lady, lady Folly, if you will? And so as we note verses 7 through 11, these are core to the message, to understanding why people are not grasping their need. It reveals something very telling about men and women. And I want you to look down through with me at verses 7 through 11. I'll read it again. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. And he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. And here, here's the main thrust of the whole chapter. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be uh, increased. Living in Virginia where I did, uh, I would travel an hour to get to work, you know, and sometimes Miss Kim does that all the time, forwards and backwards. I used to work at Apple Blossom Mall and I would travel forwards and backwards an hour to get there, an hour back home, hour to get there, an hour back home. And, and you want to know something? They're on the interstate. Because most of my travel was on the interstate. I would watch these cars as a young man, and they're zipping in and out of the traffic, and, and the, the, the speed limit was 70 miles an hour, and yet they're going like 90, 95 miles an hour, and it used to aggravate me because they seemed to always get away with it. And you know what I do? In my, my young, ignorant, foolish mind, I said, well, if they can get away with it. And they, they've been doing it long enough. I've been walk, walk, driving this road long enough. I can get away with it too. Well, that worked out fine until one day I got a speeding ticket and there was lights running behind me and all of a sudden I get a ticket going 92 in a 70 mile an hour zone and all of a sudden I learned to wise up a little bit to pay attention to say, hey, you, know, you don't want this ticket. Uh, you don't want to be locked up. You don't want your license taken away from you. You don't want to go through classes. You might want to wise up a little bit. And I did for a short space of time. I, I, I slowed down for, for a good portion of time. And I evaluated, this is what I shouldn't have done, where all the police officers normally sat. <laughs> and I'm like, I can speed from here to here and then slow down. You know, it's just, I tell you, my, my foolishness during that time, I'm glad that God didn't take me before the time. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I confessed that it was wrong. But it's interesting that you can catch cars speeding up and down all day long, but the moment you see a police car, what does everybody do? Slow down. I mean, you want some law-abiding citizens, you wait till that uh, police car's right behind you, and I've done this many a times, uh, the police car's right behind you, and you get to a stop sign, you come to a complete stop. Uh, you, you, you look both ways triple times before you go ahead and turn. You're driving two miles under the speed limit instead of <laughs> 20 over. You, you take your time before you turn right. You're polite as a citizen. You invite other people. Hey, come on out. Come on over. And I, I mean, you are just peaceable, loving, kind. And you're, you're, you're a law-abiding citizen. Why? Because you have a reverential fear for the law, right? And you know the repercussions for breaking the law. You know what it's going to cost you. And you know that the police officer is watching you. And so you are very careful. And yet God's eyes are in every place beholding the evil and the good is what our Bible tells us. And the fear of the Lord can be broken down into something very basic. And really, it's the awareness of the presence of God. Right? He's everywhere. You can't hide anything from Him. Everything's naked and open before the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. We are aware of His presence and we are aware of His power. We know what He can do. 
and particularly as children of God, we know the chastening of the Lord, which doesn't feel very good. Really, we, we could even throw in the word respect. We respect the presence of God and the power of God. And we know that He is very near. As I mentioned, this scripture here recently, Psalm 94, verses 9 through 11, He that planteth the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chasteneth the heathen, shall he not correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall he not know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teach him out of thy law. And so the wisdom of God, I like this, will make you like David. But if you are without wisdom, if you forsake the wisdom of God, you can be like Nabal. What's Nabal's na name mean? Fool, right? He says, Abigail said of her husband, for so his name meaneth. He's very foolish. We can be wise like David, or we can be a fool like Nabal. We can be wise like Daniel, or we can be a fool like Belshazzar. He knew everything that his father had done in the time past where uh, when he said, look at my great kingdom, and his wisdom departed from him, and he was like a beast for seven years until he lifted up his eyes and acknowledged that there is a God that reigneth in heaven. And then his son, not learning the lessons, sitting there in the banqueting party, drinking from the very cups that come out of the temple of God, the wood, the gold, the silver, all this... And what does Daniel say? Though you knewest all these things, and you've lifted up your heart against the Most High God. You can be wise like Daniel, or you can be a fool like Belshazzar. Or you can be wise like Mordecai, or you can be a fool like Haman. And those are the choices that we have. So what's the problem then? Why does somebody like Haman act so foolish, or somebody like Nabal act so foolish, we, we, we can see it like this. Here's the problem. Proverbs 17, verse 16. Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing that he had no heart for it? He could care less about it. He's not going to use it. He's not going to apply it. It's like giving some money to somebody who doesn't know what to do with it. You know, He's just a rich fool. He's just like, oh, I'll spend it. He has no heart for it. No heart for the wisdom of God. In fact, he, he knows all about God, but yet he, he rejects it. In Romans 3.18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Fear motivates us to do several things, doesn't it? You know, as I told you before, I got a fear of heights. You know, you get up so far. I do find all the way into that second story, Brother Ed was talking about putting up a radio tower here recently. He says, uh, uh, you want to help out? He says, this is this tall radio tower we want to put up. It's going to be like 40, 45 feet tall. I said, brother, you won't get me past about 20, maybe 25 feet, but that's pushing it for my limits. Uh, about 20 feet where I feel comfortable. And, you know, Sarah, I can tell you, you know, I went up on the lighthouse with her, and she's out there and on the edge of the lighthouse looking out yonder, and where am I? I'm clinging to the pole, the staircase. I'm like over here. <laughs> No, you're, you're fine. You check it out. You don't have to come down on the count of me. I'll just be over here throwing up for a little while. <laughs> or snakes, you know. I'm scared to death of snakes. And, you know, you, you, you realize that snakes hide out in the woods or they're underneath rocks or something like that or they're near the water. Uh, you know, I have a healthy fear of snakes. Why? Because I don't want to be near them. They bite. I stay away from them. And I just try to stay away from it all together. You guys have fears too, I'm sure. Every one of us got fears. Some people fear COVID so bad they don't want to go outside their homes. They, you know, they, they carry, go out and buy a gallon of sanitizer every, every week. And they, they, they have like 15 masks hanging up on all their mirrors and doors and everything else. And they're, they're, they're trying. And now I saw yesterday that all of Congress was able to take off their mask. Isn't it amazing? Somebody asked what changed in the science. They didn't have an answer for that. <laughs> they said, well, the CDC says. <laughs> well, they didn't have an answer for the science then. But you see what I'm saying? Your fear affects your behavior, right? 
being afraid of heights, you're not going to go out there on the edge, on a ledge. Some people, I can't imagine being on those little, in New York City, as they got these little metal buildings that are putting up stories after stories, and they're just walking on it like it's nothing. I'm like, no way. I'm like, these guys are foolish. They, they are only an inch from their lives. But if we had the fear of God, how would we act? The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso trusteth in the Lord is safe. Or do you fear man or do you fear God? The Bible talks about, um, what is it, Proverbs 23, verse 17, Let not thy heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. Proverbs 8, 13, in the previous chapter, says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, is what it tells us. Proverbs 16, verse 6, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Not only do they fear evil, but they run on the opposite direction of it. The fear of the Lord will change our way of thinking about life, doesn't it? When you got saved, it changed everything for you. Uh, I know it did for me. It changed the way that I thought about life. It changed who I hung out with. It changed my words. I used to think that in the army, you know, cuss words were normal and uh, you needed to use them to get people's attention. Afterwards, I was afraid. <laughs> it changed your music. It changed everything about you. It changed your behavior, your relationships, everything about you, but... Again, men have no heart for it. And there's no fear of God before their eyes. And that's the problem. Men are going on by and say, yeah, I've heard all that religious stuff before. Yeah, I've, I know what you're talking about, but it has no effect upon my life. and I, I'm fine. I don't need your religious... They might throw in the word garbage. I don't need your religious garbage. You know, that, that stuff's for you, but it's not for me. Why? Because they have no fear of God before their eyes. It hasn't affected their thinking, and they have no heart for it, and they could care less. And sometimes that's hard for us to understand, because when I go knocking on the door and telling them, hey, hell is real, I think that everybody should understand that hell is real. But they got so used to religion. They got so used to hearing about heaven, so used to hearing about hell. They got so used to hearing about God. And they see that there's no difference in a lot of Christians in the way they act or talk or behave. They're like, yeah, you know, I, I know all that stuff that you're talking about, but, you know, this person does this and that person does that, and they're still living and God hasn't struck them dead. And that comes to be the problem. The truth of the matter is that men are fools by nature. They must be wise on purpose. They've grown comfortable with religion. They're more content being religious than they are with being right with God. Wisdom says come, but the fool has no heart for it. Wisdom says forsake, and there is no fear of God before their eyes. But if men fear God, they would do what? They would get saved. If men truly feared hell, if men truly feared God, you know, the, the Bible says, you know, don't fear what men can do to you. Yeah, surely they could take your life. That's sure you can, you can be beheaded like Paul was and things of that nature. But don't fear what men can do to you. But what, is, what does Jesus say? Fear God who is able to cast both body and soul into hell. That's what people were missing. If men feared God, they would get saved by the grace of God. Wisdom asked men to humble themselves, to receive the truth and the grace of God in the matter of salvation, and to, here's the word, repent. And how do we know that she's asking to repent? Why? Because in verse 6, she says, Forsake the foolish. In verse 5, we could even start there. Come and eat of my bread. She's pleading. Uh, take and receive what I have to offer unto you. And as you come toward me, you forsake the foolish. And that's what repentance means. It means to turn toward God and away from 
uh, sin and away from the path that you were on, but you turn toward God and turn toward wisdom and turn toward His salvation that He has to offer you. Wisdom reproves the sin of the sinner. And it causes the heart of the wicked to recoil around it like a snake. Why? Because men loved darkness rather than light. Yeah, because their deeds are evil, yeah. You tell somebody, uh, just like uh, John the Baptist goes up to King Herod, and it says, it's not right for you to have your brother's wife. Oh, he didn't like that too much, did he? And there's a lot of things that you could say that really people are ready to fight over that. Who are you to tell me that's not right? Well, sir, it's not me. It's what the Word of God says. It reproves the sin of the sinner. It causes the heart of the wicked to recoil. And his natural reaction is uh, to recoil to the darkness because they love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. On the other hand, Lady Wisdom instructs the wise heart Wise in heart to increase in learning. And that's what he does. He says, give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. He wants to walk right. He wants to please God. He wants to grow in his faith. He wants to increase in wisdom. And again, your behavior reveals what you fear. How do you react? Wisdom, wisdom of God takes the Word of God and points the finger right at you? And that's the question, isn't it? How do you act and say, you know that one thing that you're holding on to? That's got to go. That one way that you're thinking? That's got to go. That one, uh, I don't know, I'm just saying when God points something, all of us have something, I'm sure. That anger has got to go. That love for whatever has got to go. And how do you react? And when God says something is evil, you've got to turn away from it. How do you react? That's the question. Do you say, God, show me whatever you like, and I would do it because that's, that's the way that we ought to react. A life of genuine wisdom is a life founded upon the fear of the Lord. And as you walk in the light of His holy word, really, verse 10, uh, it says, The fear of the Lord, and that fear of the Lord speaks to the power of God and His chastisement. The Bible tells us over in Hebrews chapter 12, He you feared your earthly fathers. And how much more so I want you to fear your heavenly Father. And just to have that reverential fear for His power and what He can do for you. And as I've been, I, this last week, when I mentioned 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you know, don't be deceived. God can and He will destroy those who defile His temple. And then the knowledge of the Holy speaks of His presence, being aware of His uh, being all the time present there in your life. And then we move on to our last point of our personal responsibility. We're responsible for our own actions. Uh, sometimes that's good, sometimes that hurts. You're responsible for your own actions, and essentially this is what verse 12 teaches us. Uh, you'll not be wise because of somebody else is wise for you. It's not going to be wise because uh, you know, you, you've read enough books. That's not what he's talking about. You'll be wise because you chose to be wise. You can't depend upon somebody else to be wise for you. And to not decide is to decide to stay foolish and suffer the consequences. You may not have picked up on this. Uh, you know, here recently I've, I've, I was looking down, reading down through. It was really interesting. You look at verses 4 and verse 16 and you look at them and they say exactly the same thing, don't they? With Lady Wisdom, she's pleading uh, with men, Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither, and ask for him that wanteth understanding. She saith to him, 
Come and eat of my bread. In verse 16, I believe it is, says the same thing. It's on the opposite page of my uh, Bible. Let's see. Yep. Yeah, verse 16. Who so is simple, let him turn in hither and ask for him that wanteth understanding, she saith. They both had the same pleading, but one's an imposter. One's the wisdom of God, one is the wisdom of men. It's really interesting as I read about this foolish, clamorous lady. A lot of the things that Solomon uses as adjectives for her is a lot of the things that have come in the previous chapters from Proverbs 1 all the way upward of things that uh, he tells us not to do and how not to behave. And he begins to point out several things of foolish woman is clamorous, she's simple. She knows nothing. She sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the places of a city. In other words, she's lazy. To call passengers who go right on their ways, as I've already mentioned, verse 16, stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten is secret as pleasant, but he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are the depths of hell. These are things that he's mentioned before. It's not anything brand new. And these are the things that Solomon is saying, don't do this. It's natural to men, of course. Uh, we, we look at these, these verses, you're like, how can anybody choose this foolish lady when it seems to be so obvious? Everybody knows that you, you shouldn't take stolen waters and you shouldn't eat bread and secret. Everybody knows that that's not right because it's obvious, it's right before your eyes, it's morally wrong, it's prohibited. Not, not only by the law of God, but by the law of men. And if you get caught, you know, maybe back in that day, you might lose an arm. I don't know. But it's natural for men to want that. That, that, that heart, that corruptible nature of our heart. It's not enough to want wisdom. But you must receive it by faith from God. Sermon on the Mount makes this very clear. Matthew chapter 6, you know, we look at Matthew 6 and uh, it says the things we're all familiar with. You know, don't, don't go after, don't seek for uh, clothing and house and food and raiment and these things. Why? Because your Heavenly Father knows that you have need of those things. These are all the things that the Gentiles seek for and then Jesus makes a distinction. This is what the Gentiles are seeking for. This is what the heathen are seeking for. Uh, the, the, the temporal, the fleeting, the natural. But ye, don't, don't seek for these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And He makes a distinction in what you are to seek. The Pharisees sought men's applause and they were going after and they were seeking it and they would go out of their way to do everything they can to garner up men's applause so they could pat themselves on the back about their religion. But Jesus says, go and seek God's approval and let Him approve of you and what you're doing. In Matthew 7, we can hear the sayings of Jesus where He uh, talks about the men who are building their house and He says, He who heareth and does these sayings of mine, I'll liken them unto a wise man. And the other person is hearing, but he's not doing, and there's no, nothing real. It's a, a vain sort of imaginary, elusive faith because there's nothing to it. He hears it, but he does nothing with it. He just continues on his way and lives always as he has been living. There's no change. Faith produces a change in your behavior so that you fear God, so that you lay your heart to pursuing wisdom. The wise will forsake the foolish in verse 6. The wise will hear instruction in verse 9. The wise will fear the Lord and acknowledge God's presence in verse 10. But it's a matter of personal responsibility. You have to do it for yourself, to be wise for thyself. And if you scorn wisdom, what does it mean to scorn? It means to laugh and mock and make a joke out of it. To ridicule, to... Uh, hey, hey, look at that guy over there, he thinks he's so righteous. You know, uh, that stuff's not going to help you. You're just using that religious stuff for a crutch. You know, that 
scorn, that mockery, that hatred, that vitriol, that poison in their lips toward God as Romans chapter 3 lays out for us. They laugh at those who are trying to live for God. First Peter or Second Peter chapter two and three mentions this. Who in the days of Noah sat back and were doing the same thing they've always done. Sit back and eat and drink and marry and given in marriage, and yet they were mocking the judgment as Noah was building the ark. Hey Noah, what you doing today? Uh, save all your save all that righteousness stuff for yourself. We don't need it. They don't understand. Moses' wife, as God sends him out to deliver the children of Israel, and goes back and gets his wife and his children and about ready to head back to Egypt. Moses does what the law commands him to do and he circumcises his son. And what does his wife say? You're a bloody man. That's that scorn. That mockery. A lot of people don't understand why we do the things that we do. I find it interesting that when God tried Abraham to offer up Isaac, that seems to be very much against nature. It doesn't seem natural that God will want you to give up your son, daughter, wife, anybody. And yet Abraham believes God. He goes and he gathers the wood. He takes the knife. He takes his servant. Doesn't even explain it to him. He says, you guys just stay here. Me and the lad, we're going to go up yonder and sacrifice. Doesn't even try to explain it to him because it's not natural to him. What does he want to tell him? Oh, I'm going to go up on the mountain and sacrifice my son to God. So, no, we're just going to go up yonder and worship. Now, we know from Hebrews chapter 11, he, he was persuaded of the promises of God, knowing that uh, no matter what happened, God was able to raise His Son up from the dead. What faith? But you try to explain that to somebody, that's foolishness. The wisdom of God is completely opposite. And I just want you to get this tonight. And we have a decision to choose wisdom, but most of the people that you're going to encounter, you try to witness to, you try to talk to, just remember, they don't have any heart for it. And unless they see the fear of God that really grabs a hold of their life, and they understand that they are in the grips of hell, they might not do anything. So many people promise me they want to come to church and uh, you know, you go and knock on the door with some of these people and they, they try to lead them in a prayer and they, they do nothing, go nowhere. And you're like, well, obviously nothing happened. No, we're looking for something that's real, genuine, and wisdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for this time together in Your Word. And I pray that You'll help us to have wisdom. Help us to apply ourselves to, Lord, to live for You according to the fear of the Lord. And Lord, help us to please You with our lives. And Lord, may You give us uh, understanding. Lord, we, we need to recognize we need to live in light of the fear of God. And in the presence of the Holy. And Lord, may... That changed our lives today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.